um, 10.30. So we will begin. Welcome to today's weekly live show. Um, we are returning to a guest interview today with Joyti Manuel. Uh, if you're new in this group, my name is Laura Green. I'm a yoga teacher, a teacher trainer, and a business mentor in Hampshire with a clear twofold mission to help yoga teachers to thrive by serving our communities. And this is something Joyti and I are going to be talking about today with spirituality and authenticity and how we can really step into serving as our more authentic self and also for you to be well rewarded through your teaching is you know, spiritually, emotionally fulfilled as well as obviously financially supported by the work that you do. Um, so today, as I said, we have the wonderful Joyti Manuel, and I am trying to not be gushing or a fangirl. I have never actually met Joyti before today. But some of you know this book has been thoroughly by my side for 12 to 13 years after I was introduced to it on my teacher training. I assign it as the key text on my teacher training and on my immersion course because, and to any yoga students who ask for a good introduction to all that yoga is above and beyond asana. And this is what I find this book is a real great starting point into the depths and breadth of yoga. Um, I was hooked from an analogy in it very early on about um, when we just take asana. It's like taking a recipe for a cake and only cooking the cake with one ingredient. I knew this was my book from then on and that we need all the ingredients to make the cake. So Joy to my love, over to you. I would love you to introduce yourself as all that you are aside from just the author of the book I love. Oh, thank you. So my name is Jyoti Jo Manuel. Some people know me as Jo, some people know me as Jyoti. Um, outside of having authored that book, um, I also am the founder of an organization called Special Yoga, which was uh, formed in the um, around 2003 as a started off as a physical yoga center in London, um, whose mission really was to provide a nurturing home um, for children, for families and children with uh, special and additional needs. And, um, and also to make yoga more accessible and more available, because certainly at that time, it wasn't, it was really only available to those that had money. And so I had this kind of mad mission to, to try and open it up, which was much too big and tried to do too much. And I learned that the hard way, but uh, um, we continued our journey as a, a, a now an online training school, specifically for uh, yoga as a therapeutic intervention for children and particularly children with additional and special needs. So that's predominantly what I do. And, and the underpinning of, of special yoga's work is not just about here's a set of tools, go and do them. It's about the fact that we as the facilitator or as the channel or whatever, you, however you would want to look at it, um, matter. Our state really, really matters. And I think one of the beauties of working with children who perhaps are nonverbal or who have perhaps, you know, physical disability, dif uh, different abilities. I hate the word disability because I don't think any, any of these people are disabled. I mean, that's a label we put on it. Um, actually have a lot to teach us because they're so unconditional and pure in their state. And, you know, when we are able to actually really drop expectations, drop, drop judgment, be more authentic about our, the truth of who we are, sit with our own emotional experience, then actually what happens is we hold a, uh, you know, we create a different energy field around ourselves that's more loving, caring, real. And so that's really the, the beginning of our work. Mm. I remember I've forgotten about a special yoga center because I went to your place when you were in London to do a uh, training with Judith Laster. Remember yeah. that? And um, yes, yeah, so I remember when I saw you'd moved to, to Bournemouth and online. It's amazing to be able to take those teachings um, you know, wider. And I think there's so many yoga teachers that want to move into supporting a broader demographic of adults and children and knowing the skills on how to do that as well. Um, I was saying last week we were talking about, as you mentioned there, our state, our state matters. We were talking about um, our mental state as yoga teachers and how to hold space for challenging feelings um, and not have to hide them. And I think we were saying about 
how so many yoga teachers feel that because we have the gift and the teachings and the tools of yoga in our life, that somehow or other we shouldn't be so affected by life's challenges. You know, a lot of yoga teachers who've gone through the feeling of sort of shame around depression, anxiety. Um, and I know something that's important to you about, you said, normalizing the human experience. Would you tell us a little bit more about what that means to you? Sure. So interestingly, I mean, I've been around the yoga world. I started yoga in 1974 myself. So I've been you know, around the yoga world for a long time. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen over and over and over again is, you know, it is a spiritual practice, but it's also a practice of that invites the possibility of, of um, being a master uh, and a master of your mind and a, you know, kind of sitting in that sovereignty, if you want, if you want to call it that. And I think that one of the things that happens a lot is that, you know, we can connect to the divine, you know, in one way, but if we're not connected to ourselves and our emotional experience, we put ourselves outside of our students, if you want to call them that. Mm -hmm. I don't actually call myself a teacher because I don't think I am. I think I learn as, I, I think we just share a uh, practice. So I think that there's a lack of humility in that space. And I think also that you know, if we can really sit with our own human experience, which means honoring and owning our anger, frustration, sadness, horrible thoughts, jealousy, uh, I mean, plethoras of, of, mm. of, of emotional experience. And we can actually learn how to be kind to ourselves around being a human mess, because we're all a human mess. Everybody walking on this planet is a human mess, actually. And if we can really own that, then actually what we do is we invite the possibility of other people opening up their vulnerability. And when we start to open up vulnerability, then you can have authentic conversation. Then you can have it so that it's not you separate from me, it's we. And I think that there's a real problem in the yoga world of people, of yoga teachers thinking that they're better or they should be better. And so the, what that does is it creates more anxiety. And, and actually, I don't want to be put up on a pedestal. You know, I want to be sit with you. I want to, to meet you. I want to be with you. And the only way that I can be with you is if I honor myself first. And I think that there's so much about doing out there rather than being in here. And if we can really learn to meet our hearts and sit with ourselves and sit with the difficult feelings and sit with the discomfort and actually honor it, own it and be kinder to ourselves, then actually our whole experience in communication, in, in relational field will change. Yeah, yeah. And I think you said about that feeling that, I mean, I definitely don't see the teachers around me feeling that they're better than, than, than others. But I feel there is that expectation that they place on themselves that we should have it figured out and that creates this separation in students but it also creates a separation in self and this is where you know it's only been the last few years I keep seeing the word the phrase imposter syndrome coming up again and again and again I think that's where we create in this separation of what am I today where am I today and holding space for that and it's all easy to discuss but when we're in our challenges what would you say is the best advice for a yoga teacher to how to hold space for normalizing their human experiences for the hot mess of life um, and to also be a clear vessel to deliver yoga lessons without letting our challenges muddy the water it's like how do we dance that edge I think it I think it requires practice you know and I think you know, I, I do a heart practice every day and by a heart practice, I, I, was learned, I was taught many, 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 many years ago by a Buddhist teacher to put my hand on my heart and just say, hello, how are you? And that part of myself that sometimes feels expansive and happy and sometimes feels really bruised and really broken and really painful. And when we, when we have the experiences or when I, I can only talk for me, when I have the experience of feeling that discomfort and that pain, I can choose to do any number of things with it. I can choose to get in the fridge. I could choose to go on Facebook. I could choose to avoid it, or I could choose to go, okay, so it's here. Hello, how are you? What are you here to teach me rather than running away from it? And how can I sit in the discomfort with kindness without 
further self-sabotage of, yeah, yeah, I don't like this, yeah, I don't, I don't, shouldn't have this, and all that, you know, mind stuff that goes on that makes us feel even more inadequate, you know, and I think everybody walking on this planet today doesn't feel good enough at some level anyway. So rather than feed that, I'd rather feed the kindness. And so I, that's what I do. And because it's a daily practice anyway of meeting my heart and has been for many years, and it's something we teach in special yoga as well, it gives me a, a, a place where I can acknowledge when things are difficult and it's okay that it's difficult. And somehow when we don't fight against it and we're not struggling with it and we can meet it, it gives us an opportunity and we shine a bit of love and care on it, it dissipates, the, the pain dissipates. Mm -hmm. And I think it's learning how to do that and, and it comes out of practicing over and over and over and again. And there are days when I fall in black holes and I, you know, I can't quite get myself out. And, you know, and I, that self-sabotage thoughts and I'm sitting there going to myself, you know, why are you doing this to yourself? You know, you do have a choice. So are you gonna stay in the black hole or are you gonna try and climb out the black hole? And if you need help to climb out the black hole, who are you gonna call? Yeah, yeah. You know, you say we can't sit on our own either, you know? Yeah, and I, I think that's a big part I see actually in yoga teachers' journeys at the beginning is that they'd come into teaching um, uh, with teachers <laughs> and then when they begin teaching, that kind of falls away because they start putting classes on at the same time their teachers are and they're so focused on coming into the role of a teacher, they almost forget the that we're forever a student and, and who am I going to? Where's my support? Where am I getting help? Who's bringing me back to my heart space? Um, I think it's a, a beginning part of the practice that we lose, lose our own practice for a year or so. It seems yeah, I, think, I think that is something that happens to a lot of yoga teachers mm. and I think they use classes as a way to practice and it's not, you know, mm. you, you know, our practice has to be separate from other people so that we can really truly or, and authentically sit with ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk, you said about, um, I see that your book being Spiritual Teachings of Yoga. Where do you think we are now in the appetite in community for bringing the spiritual aspects of yoga into our teaching? I know as I've been teaching, 11 years now my journey is being much more into the spiritual side and really wanting to share that um, and I sometimes feel there's students that have been with me from the beginning that you know wanted that almost a shanga based vinyasa practice and I'm getting more and more into the subtle more and more into the spiritual how do you feel the appetite is in community for spirituality I think it's mixed you know I think people are still have come into yoga to relieve anxiety, to uh, particularly at the moment, to release stress, particularly at the moment, because we're in a very, you know, weird time of the world, you know, and I think that, you know, there is uh, uh, very high anxiety and very, a lot of fear around. So I think there's, there's a population of people that are coming to yoga to help with that. And I think that there are people who've been around the yoga world for a while who might want to delve a little bit more deeply. Mm -hmm. And you know, it also behooves the question of what is spirituality anyway? You know, mm -hmm. so spirituality could be could be uh, classified as, you know, a connection to the divine. It could be classified as having, you know, positive thoughts all the time, which no one does, um, which I don't buy into anyway, because I think that that denies our humanity. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, we're human beings living a spiritual life or spiritual beings living a human life, whichever way you want to look at it. But the two have to sit side by side. And actually, I think that spirit you know the interesting thing for me about spirituality is is it depends on your relationship with god actually to some degree or a greater power i mean sometimes yeah. the word god upsets people so it could be universal power it could be um higher consciousness it could be mother nature it could mm -hmm. be the divine mother i mean all of that is the same thing it's just labeled differently yeah. and of course the labeling differently also creates a different resonance around it so i could stand in my garden with my feet on the ground and feel totally at peace with the world which would be could you could describe as spiritual you know yeah um, as much as I could be in the place where I'm talking about what my personal experience is in my own uh, journey, if you want, of um, connection, you, you know, 
And I mean, I, you know, I start every day, you know, just, you know, saying a prayer to, to who, whatever you want to call it, just yeah. ask to be the most useful vessel to myself first and foremost, mm-hmm. and then, and then to uh, however that then rolls out and manifests to the world. It's so lovely to hear you talk about your clear um, sadhana, your clear practices for you. You know, you're, you're connecting in the morning to the world, the universe, the energy, and how you may be a vessel for that, your, your heart practice, that, you know, and then within me, how am I feeling today? Um, what does your, your, your morning practice, your daily practice, your spiritual practice look like, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all. Um, I get up very early. (laughs) I usually spend some time just sitting quietly. um, And uh, that takes different forms, different days, to be honest. And, um, but I always sit and, um, and then I go and swim in the sea. So by dawn, I'm, I'm out in the sea with a group of people. And I tend to separate from the group while we're swimming. And I use a lot of that as my meditation as well. So I'm sensing the, at the moment, the, the, uh, colder water on my skin, um, the, the feeling of movement, my breath as I move. Um, and then um, generally I come back and uh, take some, uh, you know, might do some asana at that point, or I might do asana later on in the day. So that that's a, a different place. And I also do a practice every day of coherent breathing, which I forgot actually, yes. I do that in bed before I get up. So I do 20 minutes of that every day as well. In bed before you get up. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I get up and do it when I sit, yeah. sometimes I do it in bed, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a, a really powerful breathing. We're doing it in one of my courses at the moment, isn't it? And it's just, um, I remember doing it with a GP who rigged me up to all sorts of monitors and you could see in real time what was happening to the system with that breathing practice. Mm. It's a bit more, uh, more calm um, to, for myself. And, I, and I've noticed in the four or five years that I've been doing that regularly, that um, when my trauma arises and I get triggered by, by, by life, which we all do anyway, I can get myself out of it more easily and I'm calmer in it. Yes. So it's not it's denying that, it's a, that we get triggered by life. It's mm-hmm. how are we then responding and dealing and rebalancing after the trigger. You have been teaching a very long time. Was it 1989? I think I read somewhere you started teaching. You must have seen so much change. I mean, I've seen so much change in 11 years. You must have seen so much change, some positive, and I I imagine some uh, slightly lesser. If you were to look forwards into the next few years and the big shift that the online world has opened to us, how would you like to see? our what we do our yoga teaching our yoga communities the the, the sharing of yoga how would you like to see that evolve for the better um i'd like to see yoga teachers doing more inner work um i think it, it feels very important that that's part of the process it's not just learning how to sequence asana but actually how we normalize human experience how we experience being human uh, feels really important and um, also just sort of learning more about the therapeutic piece around yoga and how valuable it can be when we learn how to use it right and we learn how to listen so we don't come into necessarily a class with a you know well, we're going to do this asana assessment so actually you meet the energy and you work from there so that it's a much more therapeutically beneficial for mm. the students that are in your you know or the people that are have chosen to come to practice with you mm. That takes a lot of um, experience, I think I find with newer teachers. The the remembering what they're going to do, remembering what they're going to say, even looking around the room to begin with actually takes a lot of practice. Then to be able to go in and and not just feel and sense and tune in and ask and dialogue with our students, but to then be able to um, respond to that takes a lot of practice. How, how would you say someone starts, starts that journey of coming out of a lesson plan and into a more responsive dialogue in class with their students? I think it, it's, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's based on your practice. Mm-hmm. So my observation is, is that people are taking yoga training courses without having practiced for long enough beforehand. Mm-hmm. So I think your practice matters. And I think when you start to practice very internally and you start to really explore, you know, if you just took 
down dog as an example, right? I mean, you know, that's a position that most people who practice yoga have done a billion times. And every time you do it, there's the potential of learning something else in it. So how mindful are we in our practice or are we just whizzing through a sequence of practice, uh, which actually isn't yoga? It's not mm. yoga. We might call it yoga, but it's not yoga. So, you know, it's that, that ability to really deeply practice, deeply understand. So practice when you don't want to practice, practice when you do want to practice, practice when you feel sad, practice when you feel happy, practice at different times of day and really observe the, the inner experience so that actually you have then more embodied understanding of what you're doing. Yeah. And yeah. without embodying it, you're not an authentic teacher. You have to practice. Yeah. And I say this to, to the people that come and study at special yoga all the time. You have to practice, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to really teach you, if you're going to re teach real yoga, you have yeah. to practice. Yeah. To, but there's not an option. It's not a textbook. Um, yeah. And from that inside out, rather than, um, you know, through teacher training. <laughs> so I mean, what's the cue for that? What are the cues for downward facing dog? What's the correct cue? As if it's something external we can learn rather than saying, you know, the, the cues come from inside. <laughs> they come from in here and they're different all the time. That's yeah. right. And I think the more that we can embody the practices, the more we ensure, well, the more our confidence will build uh, by default because you understand it from a much deeper place within you mm -hmm. and then of course you know you can be more present to another mm -hmm. you know if we're not fully embodied I don't I don't actually know what we're sharing yeah and for yeah. me that's not you know that 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 that, that you know and I, and I also recognize that I've been, I've been around a long time and I've been mm -hmm. around a long time and I also recognize that people are practicing but perhaps you don't have to teach so quickly Perhaps you need to spend more time practicing. Yeah. Patience. <laughs> Patience with it. So I'm always saying slow, sustainable growth in your teaching. One student at a time with real relationships, real connection. One student at a time. And you know, if that means that you're keeping a day job, <laughs> you're going and getting a different day job so that there isn't this pressure on the, the teaching or running classes. As you said, just really being that authentic vessel for sharing what yoga is to you. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I'd like to see in the future anyway, more of that. So our inner work, our authentic teaching, slowing down, meeting people on that human experience and delivering things from a more therapeutic standpoint. I think it's what the world needs. I don't think the world needs more vinyasa flow. <laughs> the world needs more peace and yeah. loving kindness and genuine, you know, uh, pathways to learning how to be really compassionate for yourselves. Because the world's not going to get easier right now. Mm -hmm. We're in a very difficult time. And, you know, the best way through it is going to be through kindness. Mm -hmm. And I think people are more aware of it. And I think uh, there's been a big shift in my students over this last 18 months. And there, there's more prepared to slow down, <laughs> to rest, to take child's pose instead of dog, to, to tune in and go more inwards. I, I feel there's been a, there's been a big shift. There has to be, you know, and I, you know, and I think, you know, COVID is, you know, I, I mean, well, I don't know if I've had it or not, but, um, you know, what I've seen around people that have had it, you know, it, with more symptoms than perhaps I have, or I, as I, said, I don't know if I've had it or not, um, you know, it seems to be everything has to slow down. Everything has to calm down. We have to stop moving so fast. We need to go inwards. We need to nourish. We need to, you know, we need to nourish ourselves. We need to nourish the planet. We need to nourish each other, you know? And I think that there's just, it's, it, you know, in, in every challenge, there's a gift, you know, and if, if there's nothing else, that's the gift of this time. Yeah. And to raise your vibration, you know, yeah. uh, but not raise your vibration by putting un, un, unrealistic expectations on yourself, but to raise your vibration by changing your thoughts, you know. That was, um, I was really looking over this today. I don't know if I'll find it now, but that was one of the highlighted sentences I had here. Um, we have a saying, mind over matter, but the yogis wouldn't agree with this idea. 
To them, mind is not separate from matter, um, but partakes of matter, even if it's a finer and more subtle manifestation of it. For the yogis, mind is not spirit, and one of the reasons why it is so difficult to alter mind in any semi-permanent way is that it is so intimately tied up with the body, the senses, and their objects of desire. And then you go on to um, quote from the Upanishads. But yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this. Um, <laughs> well scribbled on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing what your practice, your sadhana, your spiritual journey is and how we can continue to evolve, thrive and serve both our communities and yoga, you know, in that authentic way. Um, well, thank, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> if anybody wanted to reconnect, because obviously your courses are online now, which is amazing because it's opened it up um, to a much wider audience. What's the best way for people to connect with you to find out more about studying with you? Uh, specialyoga.co.uk. Yeah. Yeah. All our courses so, are online and we've got on-demand courses as well as, uh, you know, more uh, more longer term uh, practical courses. And, you know, course, you know it's, really, it's also really interesting for me because, you know, I did in-person training for years and years and years. And mm -hmm. the seven day, what I was doing in seven days, we're now taking five months. So, of course, mm -hmm. what you What's happening is is that people are really embodying the practices and then you become better practitioners that's really interesting um, that you're finding a different depth um through the online and giving time for people to percolate and embody and practice and do with it yeah yeah yeah, yeah well please do go um see the website specialyoga.co.uk I will make sure I uh, tag that as well because I know there's a selection yeah. of wonderful courses on there. Um, did thank you so very, very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the day and you'll see swim tomorrow. <laughs> I love <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And keep, blessings to you all. And to you. Keep thank practicing. you. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye.